Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all of the military and strategic experts who are joining us here today. Uh, a few weeks ago, I wrote a statement asking the question whether the suppression of my campaign in the United States was a prelude to nuclear war. And I asked that question because it seems that no one is willing to consider what it means to declare that Russia cannot win, where it should be obvious to anyone that Russia cannot afford to lose, especially when one considers the fate of Napoleon or Hitler. And I would like to add for the record, unlike many people today, I believe that it was good that Napoleon and Hitler were both defeated. Um, now, when this question came up in a debate from which I was excluded for the reason I suspect that I asked, the Republican nominee only criticized the long-term Democratic Party incumbent for not launching the sanctions on Russia earlier, as if that would have done anything to alleviate the current situation. Um, what I wanted to just quickly remind everyone about and why we're here today and why I think this is so very urgent is a fairy tale with which most of you are probably familiar by Hans Christian Andersen called The Emperor's New Suit of Clothes. Now, most people talk about the little boy at the end of that fable who points out to everyone who's been going along with the lie that the emperor has no clothes and he shatters the lie and suddenly everyone says it. But Hans Christian Andersen actually has a different point to that story because if you remember what happens after the entire village recognizes that the emperor is naked is that the emperor continues with the parade. And therefore what has been exposed is not the vanity and corruption of the emperor, but the corruption of the entire population of the village. We have a situation now where thanks to the indiscreet text message from former British prime minister, Liz Truss to secretary of state, Tony Blinken saying it is done just moments after the Nord Stream pipelines were exploded of a situation very much like the emperor being exposed for being completely naked. And the question before us, in my opinion, is whether the populace is going to find themselves more enlightened than the crowd in Hans Christian Andersen's fable. Thank you. Well, thank you, Diane. And I think you've got a guest that you're uh, going to introduce at this point. <clears throat> yes, I do. And that is a new friend, uh, Stephen Starr, who is a laboratory advisor, retired University of um, Missouri and expert on nuclear war and nuclear weapons. And I think his presentation will be a very good reminder for people who may have forgotten why we cannot afford to go there. Well, thanks for introducing me, Diane. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor. I'm honored to be with all your guests and I fully support your candidacy. Um, would you like me to share my screen and start my presentation now? Yes, please. Okay. They can. So this is a picture of a, a large thermonuclear weapon from a distance of 50 miles that would be similar to what you would see being detonated in a nuclear war with the US and Russia. And this is an image of the firestorm I mentioned. I put the picture over New York City to give people there an idea of how large one nuclear warhead would do. They would probably be a number of nuclear warheads that would be targeted in a place like New York. Um, you know, we had the US and Russia have you know, only a few hundred cities, the population is greater than 100,000 people. So, you know, they've got plenty of warheads to go around. These warheads would be delivered uh, primarily, the launch ready warheads would be coming from intercontinental ballistic missiles. Those are long land-based missiles and they have about a 30 minute flight time going from the US to Russia or from Russia to the US. 
but they can also include submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, and if these uh, subs are parked off the coast of Russia or the US, they can hit targets uh, there in as little as seven to 10 minutes. Now, uh, a launch would be detected here by the North American Aerospace Defense Command. It's a picture of where it is in a, buried in a mountain. They're always busy 24 hours a day getting ready for a nuclear war. Uh, if they detect it, then what will they do? Well, the US and Russia have maintained a policy of what they call launch on warning for quite some time. What this means is if a, a nuclear strike is detected on early warning systems, <clears throat> we'll launch a retaliatory strike um, before the, the strike arrives, while the enemy, enemy missiles are in the air and before any nuclear detonation occurs. So a false warning of attack, if it's believed to be true, would make the retaliatory strike a nuclear first strike. In other words, accidental nuclear war. There have been many false warnings of attack in the past, but you know when you have uh, low levels of tension, um, they're less likely to be believed. But you know right now we don't have that. So missile flight times determine the time allowed to order a nuclear counterattack. The president must order a retaliatory missile strike that allows his missiles to launch you know, uh, before the incoming nuclear warheads destroy them. So uh, it takes at least a few minutes for early warning systems to issue an attack warning. The people at NORAD are tasked to provide a warning within three minutes. And a missile attack by subs off the coast will allow only a few minutes of time to contact the president. You know, if you have seven minute, 10 minute time from a launch to impact, it doesn't give you very much time to evaluate it, have a threat conference and uh, figure out what to do. So you have three minutes to detect and confirm such an attack. Uh, then you would have a, the president is contacted in the situation room if he's at the White House or somewhere else by a secure line overseas. And he has, with a sub attack, you'd have maybe 30 seconds to have a conference. You'd be told what's going on and what his options are to retaliate. And then he, he would, it takes, let's say, assume he gives the order to launch right then. It takes two to three minutes to give and transmit the launch order. It takes about two minutes for the ICBM, the intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, launch to, to, to be launched and get out of harm's way. And it takes about 15 minutes for sub-missile launch. So, but just suppose a warning of attack was false. Um, I mentioned the nuclear, if the presidents are not at the White House, they're always followed by a nuclear suitcase. And it takes about one minute for those to order a launch. It's an automated communication device that connects the president to the National Command Authority. Now, this is um, what it would look like in Russia if they detected an attack. This is their NORAD. So I, I wanted to mention that the Russian military can issue a launch order that bypasses all lower levels of command. They're ready to... Um, launch within 10 minutes, they, and not just the, the president, but also their uh, defense minister and the current uh, chief of the general staff has the nuclear briefcases there. They're all able to give the order. The Russian military can follow US pattern of launch procedures, or they can order a, a remote launch. They can push a button and override all the lower subordinate chain of command and missile launch crews. You know, they're, they're threatened if they have a missile coming at Moscow and they have you know, they might even have less than seven minutes. So they're streamlined to attack. Once these missiles are launched, it cannot be recalled. Um, if there is an attack, a full-scale war, this is an image created by scientists that did peer-reviewed studies that show what would happen. Each click is one day. Uh, the smoke rises into the stratosphere from nuclear firestorms. You know, uh, an 800 kiloton warhead creates a 150 square mile firestorm. So you know, 500 of those would probably create 50,000 square miles of nuclear fires. Um, the scientists estimate that 70% of the sunlight in the northern hemisphere would be blocked from reaching the surface of the earth, and about 35% in the southern hemisphere. The smoke is above cloud level, cannot be rained out, and it would relate, remain in the stratosphere for about 10 years. The first uh, one to three years, daily temperatures in Central North America and Eurasia would be below freezing. And after it, was, it would be at least 10 years before the weather would be warm enough to grow crops. So most humans and animals would starve to death. Um, and I think that's probably all you need to see. <laughs> okay, well, that was an efficient report, uh, which will now be followed by 
our next speaker, Scott Ritter, United States Marine Corps, an intelligence officer, military analyst, the former chief weapons inspector, inspector to Iraq from 1991 to 98, charged with finding and destroying weapons of mass destruction. And uh, he had some uh, difficulties with some of the people that uh, didn't want him talking, and he's been talking ever since. So, Scott, we're happy to have you. Take it away. Well, thank you very much for having me, and thanks for um, for everybody for, for coming. Um, you know, we live in a day and age where I, I think the American public is, um, I'm not going to say immune, but um, ignorant of the reality of nuclear conflict. I grew up during the Cold War. Um, my father was a career Air Force officer. Uh, at that time, there was a book, a um, popular book called Alas Babylon, and that was a code name. It was a story about nuclear conflict. And uh, it was a term that a, a military officer would call his wife and say, nuclear war is upon us. Um, and my parents adopted that same phrase because my father was involved in Air Force units that were responsible for the delivery of nuclear weapons. And um, you know, <laughs> I don't think there's a, uh, a husband or a father out there that doesn't love their family and doesn't hope that their family can survive the unthinkable. And so my parents adopted that code word. And I can tell you that uh, almost every other Air Force family did the same thing. And what that means is that my mother and my sisters and I uh, grew up um, with every day potentially being the last day of our lives. And this was real to us. We understood it. We understood what was happening. This isn't just ducking cover underneath the desk. This is understanding the real consequences. When I lived in Germany, uh, we lived next door to a place called North Point. North Point was a nuclear weapon storage uh, facility for of the United States um, Army in Europe. It would be one of the first targets attacked by the Soviets if the balloon ever went up. And during the late 1970s and early 1980s, the balloon was threatening to go up on a daily basis. And so we literally got into the school bus every morning wondering if the world would end that day. And when my father disappeared into the bunker, the nuclear bunker, by the way, and was incommunicado for several days, um, the fear factor was, was genuine and real. I joined the Marine Corps to serve my country. Um, my first unit that I was assigned with was a nuclear capable artillery unit. And we oftentimes carried out uh, exercises uh, practicing the launch of nuclear weapons. And I will tell you that um, we did our job. I mean, we, it, it, was, it was basically get the job done, train, 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 so that it's muscle memory. So that if time comes um, and you have to do it, there's no thinking, you just do it. So the hope that um, a military professional somehow going to grow a moral conscience and say, I refuse this order. Don't hope that. Military professionals carry out the mission that they're given. Um, and this came to light, that the consequences came to light during a, um, a division level field exercise where we were training to stop a Soviet invasion uh, through Iran, where they were going to try and capture the warm water ports. And we simulated uh, going into Iran to, uh, to intercept them and stop them. And of course, we had insufficient forces. The Soviets broke through our lines and are moving forward. And uh, the order was given for the artillery to fire the nuclear round. And we fired it. And there's a lot of procedures involved in that, and I won't get into it. But um, the bottom line is the simulated round went down range, and we hit the, um, the Soviet units. Uh, we destroyed them. And then the follow-on echelons, which are trained to operate in a nuclear environment, passed through the uh, area. And and then the war ended. And I said, wait a minute, we didn't get a chance to fight these, uh, these next guys. They said, no, no, it's, it's over. So why? And they said, well, because they hit us with nuclear weapons and, and we're dead. It's indexed, done. <laughs> That's the reality of nuclear war. Um, you don't get to live and fight again. You die instantly. Uh, I went on from that job to be a weapons inspector at the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, implementing the first disarmament of nuclear weapons. At that time, and people don't remember a lot. I mean, I think almost everybody in this panel is old enough to remember, but the world almost came to an end several times in the 1980s because of intermediate nuclear range missiles. Soviets had SS-20 missiles, three warheads. We deployed Pershing-2 missiles and ground-launched cruise missiles in a response. The Pershing-2 at that time, if fired from a position in West Germany, could strike Moscow within seven to 12 minutes. And this is what Stephen Starr was talking about, uh, the, the absolute inability to make reasoned thinking during, uh, during that time period. And we, tr we trained them all the time. There was a scary incident in the 80s where the Norwegians launched a atmosphere's tech test rocket 
and the Soviets mistook it for a, a first strike. Um, fortunately, the Soviets had somebody who hit the pause button and they didn't go into the launch on, launch on war, or else none of us would be here. But the 1980s was all about dodging nuclear Armageddon. And one of the greatest things that has ever happened, it's one of the most underappreciated moments in American history, is when Ronald Reagan signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, because we literally saved the world from suicide, from nuclear death. If it weren't for the INF Treaty, I firmly believe that there would have been an accident that spun out of control and led to a general nuclear exchange. We got rid of those missiles and we start, set the stage for a larger disarmament, strategic disarmament reduction. But we have forgotten about that sense of because the Soviet Union went away, Russia has emerged, we don't respect the Russians as much, but now we belittle them. We don't under, we've forgotten what the reality of nuclear conflict is to the point where we're actually, we reactivated the 53rd Artillery Brigade, which was a Persian II Brigade during the Cold War. They've reactivated in Germany and we're getting ready to deploy a new family of intermediate uh, range missiles, the so-called Dark Eagle hypersonic, which gives us rapid first strike capability against Moscow, which will trigger. Now people say, "Oh, well, wait a minute, can't we win a nuclear war? Let me give you a quick war story and I'll end with this. I, ins I was an inspector outside of a Soviet missile factory, Botkinsk. They produced the SS-20s. We were ensuring they didn't produce any more. They also produced something called the SS-25. And we had a little incident in, um, in March of 1990 where um, we had this giant X-ray machine that we wanted to, by treaty, we're supposed to X-ray the SS-25 canisters to make sure they weren't hiding the SS-20 missiles inside. Uh, and the Soviets refused to allow it to go operational for reasons I won't go in here. It wasn't their fault. Um, but in the process during the crisis, they sent three missiles out of their plant. And um, we, we were like, why would they do this? Why would they, why would they risk the ire of the United States, risk the treaty, just three <laughs> missiles out of the plant? Well, it turned out that those missiles were SS-25 missiles. They weren't prohibited by the treaty, but they weren't missiles designed to deliver nuclear warheads. They were missiles designed to carry a communications package. They were called, they were, the, 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 the SS-25 was no longer the Topol, it was the Sirena. And the Sirena is part of a system called the Dead Hand or Perimeter. And these missiles were part of nine, a, a contingent of nine, six had already been sent out, uh, that were a special regiment that in times of conflict automatically go to the field. They're always in the field. And if we succeeded in carrying out a first strike against Russia that decapitated their leadership, the people in Washington, D.C. might think, the war gamers might think, aha, advantage America, Russia won't do anything. Russia will do everything because the dead hand takes over. Destroy uh, Russian or Soviet command and control communication signals are sent to the dead hand control room, stop functioning. And when they stop functioning, the dead hand kicks in. And the dead hand launches these Sirena missiles with their communication package, and they fly across the, the, the length of Russia broadcasting launch codes, which automatically send the entirety of the Soviet nuclear force to their targets, the world ends. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot win a nuclear war. It's impossible. And yet we continue to build weapons that makes us think that we can manage the escalation of a nuclear conflict. It cannot be done. We use one nuclear weapons against the Russians. They launch everything automatically. There is no escalation control. There is no escalate to de-escalate. There's only instant Armageddon, the death of all humanity. And that's the message I want to impart. Nuclear wars cannot be won. They should never be fought. And therefore, nuclear weapons should never exist.